Imagine a time when you could stand where I am now and look down the hill to the wetlands and sunset orange water of the harbour. Imagine the sight of towering trees that reached for the sun, a sight that has long been replaced by concrete and steel. Imagine the feel of the rock and dirt beneath your feet and the memory of familial footprints that go back millennia. Imagine the smell of rotting undergrowth, sweet flowers, and the bitter taste of smoke from campfires cooking fur-covered meats. Listen to the sound of women singing songs whilst fishing in their nawi, the sound wafting up over still waters, carried up through to our ear here on the hill. Imagine hearing the scolding of overactive children as they threaten to tip the precarious bark endeavours. This is where we are. That time is here now amongst us, not the past. Though the clocks, calendars and cartography tell us that that world has passed and been shaped by other forces, we will forever live in the memory of the time we are using our imaginations to remember. We may have never known it but that time lives in the memory of this place, and the now is a moth newly born emerging on the underside of a leaf without knowing it is destined to live only three transits of the sun and moon. It thinks the now is all there is without sense of age of the leaf or the tree or the connection to the tree, to the ground and its roots and the cycles of droughts and floods and the scars and its bark and the many children it has around it struggling for sunlight and a place to grow. The now is a moth that eats and mates and dies without ever knowing forever. Imagine now thousands of witnesses gathering on the rocky outcrops, beaches and bays from high vantage point and low. And imagine as they see almost 250 years ago, a, a travel weary ship catching robust gusts in its gray white sails like flapping wings. See as they saw that ship arrive a sense of wonder, a sense of curiosity, a sense of fear, a sense of story, stories told and stories to be told. These gathered Eora. Now imagine the stories that are forgotten, the stories left untold, and the great distraction that ensued. Do not be misled, the now time is just a distraction from the lessons learnt of the past. The now is a moth with no sense of the long, deep memory of our history here. The white sails have fluttered and blustered and ate and mated and inevitably will die, leaving only the tree to remember the story of the moth like now. The act of feeding ourselves, the cultural practice of welcomes, elders, the care of country, story, ceremony, teaching the next generation, remembering the generations that have gone by. All this memory will lead us to a stronger place in this country if we learn to embrace it, or we will die like the moth. In this, I remember and give thanks to the elders who have gone before us, who even now are amongst us and guiding us, their invisible hand who has brought us here to this place and time, here in this room of tempers and temperance. One such hand is the ghost, white, visible, invisible hand of Nick Enright and I will remember him here. His was a hand that could support and guide, deliver a loving caress and a stinging slap. His hand can be seen in the careers of many and in the institutions he was part of, in his plays, his signature, in the quiet corners where conversations would happen and the pulpits from which he would sermon. His handprint sits like a stenciled mark on my soul. I ask you now to put your hand up if you ever studied with Nick Enright. if you ever worked with him, if he ever did you a favour, if you ever ate a meal with him, if you ever read his plays, seen his plays, acted in them. Put your hand up if you ever heard a story of Nick's generosity and love. He is everywhere, in Australian theatre and beyond. The invisible and visible hand of Nick Enright is all around us and lives on in us. I even now have to imagine Nick is still with us when I face kind of moral and ethical dilemmas. And I, and I think, you know, <laughs> what would Nick do? 
And several times when there's been a play that needs a senior guiding hand, a playwright in search of a dramaturg, a student in need of a teacher, I, I have that thought. <laughs> Where the fuck is Nick when you need him? <laughs> but mostly I just think I miss Nick Enright. The hand that could give that loving touch, lift you up in support, and the hand that could slap you so hard you would sting for days and months and years. His hand hit me once. I felt it like a slap even though he never touched me. The slap came in the form of a preview talking to, where he criticized my lack of judgment on the work we had done together on the Sunshine Club. Now, this was a musical about um, black and white dance halls across the country after World War II. He had drawn my attention to the material, uh, the subject matter, and a few years earlier, and he had championed it through its process with great support from Robin Nevin. His criticism was harsh, and it was personal, and it was so, so right. He cut me. He slapped me away when I, would, when I demanded to be cared for and nurtured. He was tough. And when I wanted him to be tender, I didn't talk to him for almost three years, so was my shame, not until he was really sick. He had pointed out my indulgence and refused to allow me to charm my way through uh, out of the situation um, by playing the, the race card or, or demanding a different standard because I was Aboriginal or, or my first ever musical or my premiere season at the Opera House. He gave me no room to wriggle out. I didn't know it at the time, but he was teaching me even then, like an old auntie's tough love. Never indulge in the self-referential sentimentality of autobiographical justification. <laughs> the only real truth is the truth the audience demands from a story. No matter how much you want to use your writing to heal yourself, write your personal story onto the public record to be loved by others or pontificate about an injustice, your ultimate responsibility is to make sure the audience are receiving your story as it wishes to be told. Now, Nick was no saint, but in his humanity, he had this sense of selflessness and uh, the honorable pursuit of writing that many of us share, to be the storyteller of the tribe to tell the stories that answered a need, not necessarily for your own sense of ego, but a broader need. I can't say he never wrote his autobiography into plays, but I can say he never gave in to the self-indulgence within that material. He never wrote the play where the teacher falls in love with his student, but he came close with a poor student. He never wrote the play about a childless man who ached to be surrounded by youthful exuberance and see the next generation flourish, but he came close with a man with five children. He never wrote the play about being a gay man in the country, but he came close when he wrote the book uh, to The Boy From Oz. He never wrote the play about crippling guilt of being white in a black country, but when he co-wrote the adaption of Cloud Street and helped Jimmy Chi write his musicals and helped me shape the Sunshine Club and many, many more, he came close. In many ways, he didn't write his own story, but he wrote for all of us, and when he couldn't, he assisted us to write our own. I will forever be grateful to Nick Enright, and in the deepness of time, he will be remembered not only for his writing, but also through his contribution to the many lives he touched, the many lives in this room and the countless others outside. It is a great honour to deliver this inaugural Nick Enright keynote, and I thank you for this opportunity. I can still smell the smoke. I believe storytellers play one of the most important roles in our society. They hold the history of the clan, the lessons learned. They provide a vocabulary for change. They can entertain, educate, agitate, celebrate. Storytellers excite a society, uniting them despite their differences by providing a single moment in time where you can feel part of something bigger. This is why the tribe hunts for us, gives us food, provides respite from the everyday pressures of survival, provides shelter, so that we can focus on telling their stories, refreshing the old and imagining the new. This is an unspoken contract with the society. We must be the best storytellers we can so that those story listeners can understand their world better. Growing up, my family and I would return to Strabrook Island, to Minjilaba, across Kondomuka, uh, to attend different family gatherings, weddings, funerals, birthdays. And I have one memory of a wedding where Auntie Kath Booker, Ujuru Nunako, recited a poem for the gathering. 
Now, it's a poem. I can't find the exact line in a published writings, and I suspect it was written for the occasion, for this relative's wedding, or, or maybe it's an early draft of a later work. I distinctly remember through the fog of time, the breeze coming through the bay and the sun shining, and her words, I am the tree, and the tree is me. She went on to ask the tree its history and memory of the world. In this one line, I caught the sense of connection and responsibility. Standing amongst my extended family on an island that had, been, had seen countless generations birthed and marry and die, a place where stories had laid dormant and resurfaced, remembered and reshaped. It was the 1970s. I know. <laughs> I would have been perhaps about eight, and this line has stuck with me for over 40 years. The other distinct memory I have of that day was when Arnie Kath said the line, I am the tree and the tree is me, and another relative calling out from behind, she'd shit herself if, she'd sit, shit herself if the tree talked back to her, eh? <laughs> and everyone laughed and the moment was gone. Whatever point she was trying to make just evaporated, the, the transient laughter robbing that moment and taking me away from a time of thoughtfulness, perhaps. I have rewritten that line in my head over and over through the years. What if the call had been, what did the tree say back to you, Kath? If he had included her so she could have responded. If he had broken the mood with a comic interruption, yes, but not departed from the substance of the drama she'd been setting up. If he had not set up a sense that we, the congregation, were complicit in the rejection of the moment by addressing only us rather than also the speaker. It's weird how little things stick with you. I read this situation as apocryphal, the, the, the fate of a writer and the possible issues with audiences. Don't get too serious for too long or you might lose your listener. <laughs> Include their understanding of the moment for fear that they might take that moment away from you. Recently at APAM, Jacob Baum gave a fantastic keynote address where he played out an all too familiar conversation between a fictional black artist and a white gatekeeper. The familiarity of the situation and the responses were breathtaking. I'll, this is Jacob's words. I would like to, oh, for those who don't know APAM, it's a market, the Australian performing arts market. I would like to give just one example of how the conventions of this sector and of a market such as this could currently be interpreted from a First Nations perspective. Whitefella still has all the power, authority and autonomy, uh, autonomy to di dictate what trading and economic systems we operate under. Whitefella determines what excellence and quality is. Whitefella still manages and has curatorial control of performing arts venues Blackfella could work in. Whitefella still programs black stories, either written or directed by Whitefellas, and determines the black narratives that audiences engage in. Blackfella says, fuck me, if I'm going to make a living out of this, I better do that same kind of shit too. Blackfella gets busy making that kind of work, that kind of narrative that intrigues, delights, traumatizes, tantalizes, and satisfies the curious mind about Blackfella's culture, identity, traditions, and modernity. Blackfella constantly talking about being a Blackfella. Blackfella gets an opportunity to pitch their work. Whitefella says, not Aboriginal enough. Blackfella has another go. Whitefella says, now, I want you to condense 70,000 years of ancestral lineage, of continuous culture and creative practice, of complex totemic skin and ceremonial systems complicated by 229 years of colonization, survival, government and social policy that continues to actively oppress your peoples and sovereignty in, into a two-minute elevator pitch and marketing blurb. <laughs> but make it exciting and make it accessible. <laughs> like you, the audience were in stitches. But backstage, I was listening, and I was actually moved to tears. I, I, I couldn't see who was laughing, and it made me think in a weird, weird and wonderful way. How often has this been the truth? How long has it gone like this, unspoken? And why are they laughing? I, I couldn't see their faces, and I was concerned. Who is this audience and their connection to what is being said? Why should this truth-telling be read as humour? Why should we deliver it as humour? Why should we think that these words are entertainment? And is the message really getting through? When I talked to Jacob afterwards about this, he said, it was the blackfellas laughing the loudest. He said, I, I totally understand your point, Wesley. Well, the point you're making, but my experience post-speech was one of brother and sisterhood from our mobs and guilt and mere culpa from the words of non-Indigenous mob who spoke to me and in the eyes of those who wouldn't. It was without doubt that Jacob had hit his mark. But these two stories still have clear lessons for me. Deliver your ideas too seriously and your message will be washed away. Deliver your message too flippantly and, you, and they will be washed away 
but have nothing to say and you will be washed away. The pressure to fit a mould not always of your own making. It's a little bit Goldilocks, really. Not too much, not too little, just right. But these two stories remind me of why I wanted to be in the arts in the first place. I wanted to tell the stories that were not being told. I wanted to speak up and say the things that were hard to say. I wanted to call out injustice. I was attracted to the power of storytelling to change the hearts and minds of a congregation and through them the world. The artist tells stories to make sense of the world, to give an emotional vocabulary for the human condition in all its extremity, to help remember our collective history, to shine a light, to expose creation. Idealistic? Maybe. But isn't the role of the young and the stubbornly progressive and the artist to be ambitiously idealistic? Alas, the young grow out of it. Uh, they become more reasonable with age. The stubbornly progressive collapse under the weight of too, too much disappointment. But the artist must continue to have ambitions for their community, their society, their country. For why else do we exist if not to stay true and hold firm belief in our purpose and our power? to help shape the world as we would want it to be. Now, each of us here will have a story of that moment we felt that power, when the thrill of the voice excited us enough to motivate a lifelong vocation. This moment gives us strength and pure, clarifying thought. It is this moment we return to in our darkest times when confidence flees and the doubts pile up to block out the sun. Everyone feels like this at some point. I remember one such moment on the opening night of the Sunshine Club at the opera house, I sat eating, eating jelly beans, catatonic with doubt, and felt abandoned to my own fears. The kind of fear that, that only others can help you escape, but equally stops you from reaching out for them. There is a balance between the need for professional confidence and professional doubt. Too much confidence can make you arrogant. Too much doubt can cripple you. Artists need to negotiate with their demons and their cheerleaders and somehow never fully believe either. We have to believe we are making a difference in the world. No wonder we gravitate to like-minded people who, who bolster our personal emotional resources, collaborators who agree with us, audiences who get what we, we are about, the good reviewers, not the bad ones. <laughs> and I'll come back to this idea. It is our sense of purpose we must constantly return to as a guide. Why do we exist and why are we storytellers? Everyone will have a different answer, but I would be concerned if any of you were primarily motivated by celebrity cash and feeling safe. <laughs> why are you an artist, a writer, a director, a performer? I could also say the same thing about an audience member. Why do you pursue an artistic experience? Fame, money, emotional security? Or in fact, the exact opposite of these things. To experience something new to share moments with others, to feel part of a group, to enrich my life, to be lifted to a state of ecstasy through extreme beauty. There is no long-term artistic purpose in being agreeable, liked or lauded. There is no long-term value in just telling a society what it already knows. Artists interrogate the norms and show the familiar from a new angle perhaps as a warning, a clarion call to change, or as a deep observation of human behavior. This is as old as time, from Medea to Hedda Gabler, from the creation stories of Marucci and Coulomb to the drover's wife. But in recent years, I have witnessed a growing timidity in our cultural leadership, and I include myself in this. Too concerned with upsetting audiences, politicians, sponsors, donors, funders, so much so that we have become timid in our role as storytellers. Have we forfeited the field and now find ourselves hiding behind remakes of classics, experimentations in form, and a too often self-congratulatory malaise of irony and sarcasm? Have we lost touch with our responsibilities to the tribe? And let me digress here just for a second. Is it just me, or are we seeing more homophobia and racism and sexism on our stages? And more often, are they written by homosexuals, blackfellas, and women? I've sat in a number of shows in the past few years and asked myself, are all these people sitting around me laughing in the dark, laughing because they recognize the situation and the truth of it, or are they laughing out of a sense of comic ridicule of the scenario playing out? Are we laughing with or at? Are we the audience of like-minded people who can see the craft of the writer and read the nuance of the extremity being played out, or 
Are there some amongst us who recognize themselves on stage and easily side with the racist character, the statement, the situation, with a forgiving chuckle? As I sit in the dark engulfed by a sea of white middle-class urbania and feel the tide of my own discomfort ebb and flow, and I'm struck with the thought, what are they laughing at? When confronted, I've, I've heard writers say, yes, I'm telling racist jokes, but I'm doing it ironically. Yes, I'm using the trope of sexualized female characters, but it's a parody. But the prejudice position I'm using is sarcastic. I'm inciting debate and discussion. I don't believe in what the characters are saying. Call me old fashioned, but I reckon if you're not busying yourself deconstructing the status quo, you are making a decision to unconsciously construct it. Can an audience read the difference between an ironic use of a racist joke or a stereotype or a rhetoric and flat out racist slurs? Sarcasm and irony are very dull tools to sharpen a political message. Like with the speech from Jacob, I get that the words are dripping with irony and sarcasm because I'm part of the in crowd. But what if you're not in on it? Are you receiving the intention of the artist? We can all name shows where we have laughed because we are part of that crowd who get it. The fabulous works of Declan Green, the amazing Nakia Louie, two writers I adore and get excited by watching the twists and turns of the stereotypes and the best escalations of farce and comedy I've seen. But I'm left with this gnawing question. What happens if the audience don't understand the history? If they have emerged from under the leaf and can only see what is in front of them and think this is the whole world? I can hear the defences. We can't go at the pace of the slowest. We can't ignore the pre-existing body of work. Audiences are smarter than that. We Trojan horse our messages inside the comedy. Or, or, or you have to give people what they want sometimes. I think there is a shrinking body of contemporary Australian work that is so bold as to express big ideas clearly through characters that are unambiguous about their thoughts on the world. We are seduced by the recrafting of a classic, the popular forms of comedy and music theatre, or of well-worn paths, the acceptable and the legitimate. And God, I know it's not easy. I mean, you just have to talk to Patricia Cornelius or, or Stephen Sewell, and they'll attest to the difficulties of writing the powerful stories and importance that are our, of our country, and then getting them in front of an artistic director, let alone in front of an audience. But I can't help thinking we are conveniently writing not for the whole tribe, but for the small number who already agree with us, sometimes hiding little Easter eggs in, in our works as a kind of literary wink to our peers. And I wonder if we've become accustomed to subverting our messages and burying them deep in things that make them acceptable, tame, and palatable. And along the way, shaping the taste of the audience to the point that they have become less interested in the artist's voice, lost the stomach for risk. And so it becomes a self-serving cycle. We modulate our work to not offend the audience, and the audience becomes less skilled at dealing with big ideas. So we, we, we further bury our voice, and so on and so on. And those who are seeking the voice of the artist, the audience out there who want us to help explain their world, the audience who crave big ideas to shape new thoughts, explore the edge of human experience, are left disappointed, perhaps. This is a time to be brave before it's too late. Where are the plays about treaty and sovereignty in Australia? Where are the new voices talking about feminism and inequality? Where is the artistic work that will support the Me Too and the Time's Up actions? Climate change, Manus Island, the greater class divides growing in our country, the intergenerational burdens. We all know of artists creating this work with heart and nuance and the rare examples of where they have found their way to the stage. And maybe we are caught in a cyclical trap of fashion where we merely tire of the companies and the artists and the works who, who strike out to make a difference. We fund them and defund them and support them and drop them as we follow the next wunderkind and international trend and cause celeb. Like the politics of our era, we are scared to express our values through our work. We don't talk about our core beliefs or the, the national cultural project we're involved in. We get caught in the economic justifications for supporting artists and avoid discussions about intrinsic value and the millennia-old role of the storyteller. We let that deep history sit in the background somewhere and allow people to forget the importance of art. We have vacated that territory we inherited, and we are to blame. We are complicit through our self-censorship, as well as the censorship of others. The growing disrespect of story and storytellers is because we are not mounting the winning arguments. I can hear it, I can hear it. I, I think I've even said this at times. It won't sell, no one wants to hear that story. 
You need to build your audience up first before you slap them down. Isn't that a little old fashioned? Do you, you don't want to be known as that writer. Politics is a background, not a foreground in a good play. We've been commissioned in ways to shrink ourselves and in many ways shrink the cultural voice of our nation. We have abandoned bravery in favor of bankability. We have accepted commercial precedent and formula rather than succeed in our responsibilities to the tribe. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not anti-popular. I'm not suggesting we should perform alone, you know, in a room and expect the tribe to support us. Quite the opposite. We must be fiercely, we must fiercely pursue the popular, the vox populi, vox dei, but we must embrace the discomfort of a forward-thinking vision for a future rather than the comfort of an imagined nostalgia where the world was easier. And I can tell you now, the world is much easier for me and my family than it was 50 years ago, and I doubt that my family would have been part of any nostalgia. At the extremes, I think sometimes producers look to the comfort of precedent, the reliability of what has gone before, what has worked, the power of recognition for an audience, it is more known, it's predictable, more calming. Producers will give importance to the managing of risk, sometimes minimizing risk. Oh, some would even like to totally you know, remove risk. And this means looking to the past, analyzing data, and finding a formula to predict the future. But an artist lets history sit in our creative landscape and we stare out to a horizon. A good artist is connected to their community in constant dialogue and through their work speaks an osmotic truth. Artists and creative thinkers are spending their time imagining new futures, new ways of being, new inventions, and as in, as in industry, the ability to explore and fail is so powerful, and more often than not, antithetical to market forces. In fact, market forces can often create stagnation in creative arenas, and that is why research and development departments exist in these large companies, multinationals. Like Google spent close to $10 billion dollars in research and development in 2014. Almost 15% of its revenue, Tesla, Apple, Boeing, all realize that market competitiveness means that they have to invest in the R&D. Artists are the research and development department of a society. We are attracted to the most dramatic and energetic situations in a community, and we seek to expose it, explore it. We go where no mere mortal dare go, is too scared to go. We live the contradiction of being outsiders and deeply embedded in our community, and we play a national role to give voice to the silent, provide visions of a future, help create vocabularies for change, and to use our time on this planet making it a better place. We play a role that comes with this responsibility, but are we playing that role adequately? I see artistic directors as the unelected representatives of a cultural parliament, and as such, they have many constituents they are indebted to, but they are artists, and their role is to champion the artistic pursuits of an organization, represent the conversations of artists in the community, but I am increasingly worried that these roles are being diluted and artistic directors are being pressured to abandon the brave in favor of these kind of commercial yardsticks. I know it's a balancing act, but the weight of safety cannot be allowed to crush the natural artistic need to risk it all. As a sidebar, um, I'm interested in the role of, of collaborations and dramaturgy in supporting new work. Like Jacob, I'm keen, keen to see um, strong indigenous voices that reflect cultural and artistic authority. Artistic directors are making choices to change the status quo or not, and are empowered to do so or not. On two occasions in the past five years, I've, uh, I've heard through, from literary managers of large companies taking credit for dragging the play out of a First Nations writer, shaping it into the success it had become. I found this, bit, uh, this attitude a bit patronizing, and it raises questions about how works are shaped by the collaborators you allow in. Ujuru writes in one of her poems, Assimilation, No. Pour your pitcher of wine into the wide river, and where is the wine? There was only the river. How are we and our works being shaped by the gatekeepers and the shifting corporate culture of our publicly supported arts companies? The more commercially interested the companies become, the more they are under pressure to shape a program of activities around precedent, risk avoidance, and the vocal minority of the offended. They provide feedback and shape works with this knowledge and inadvertently nudge and cajole writers into a box not of their own making, like a wine-flavored river. 
Alana Valentine writes in her new book, Bowerbird, which is published by Currency Press and you can buy it for $25. <laughs> Bad feedback will try to suggest how to make the play more like the one the dramaturg would like to write. Good feedback asks what you were trying to do in that moment and tells you that you need to work harder, more creatively to achieve it. Great feedback pinpoints a problem you can see straight away. And I'm not rejecting the support of others, but I, I am growing concerned that there is a superficial embracing of diverse writers with distinct voices, in this case, indigenous writers, but then no real wholesale investigation of where the work comes from or where is the right home. And I feel that the writers know exactly the answers, but are never asked. Or the companies are too scared to ask for fear that what is a precarious acceptance is complicated by messy differences. <laughs> and the writers are caught in a complicity of gratitude. It is easier to comply and be rewarded by the like-minded many who will eventually pay to see your work on their stage. So we must ask ourselves, do collaborators weaken our resolve or strengthen them? And how are we in charge of that? I wrote this little thing here and I think it's shit. <laughs> I was making this analogy between, you know, like you get a banana milkshake and you taste it and you're told it's banana, but it really has no relationship to banana. And then often we have this kind of tension between you know, being told something is, but when you taste it for real, you go, oh my God, it's amazing. And that thing has never grown in the ground. <laughs> Nick Enright said, never turn up without a sharpened pencil. The unspoken contract between our communities and us as storytellers demands that we are intrinsically entwined, that we are responsible to be the eyes and ears of, for the people who are affording us the time to see and hear. Oh, yes. And for us to think and speak. I'm going to say that again. The unspoken contract between our communities and us, as storytellers, demands that we are intrinsically intertwined, that we are responsible to be the eyes and ears for the people who are affording us the time to see and hear and to think and speak, to be a popular voice for the nation that we are shaping and which shapes us, to pursue the hard to do more than the easy to say, to not be reduced to our politics but be emboldened by them, to find the form in the content of the story and encourage deeper understandings, to avoid the indulgences and self-congratulations of the coterie of the like-minded, whilst protecting our honourable and history-laden vocation to be the storyteller of the tribe. The last word here I wish is to give to Annie Kath, and it's interesting, it's been 15 years since Nick Enright passed away, and it's been 25 years this year since Annie Kath uh, Ujuru Nunakal passed away. And like all storytellers, everything is filtered through a prism of what makes a good story, what makes the memory stick. And I was talking to a family member about this, this memory of the statement, the, the, the quote, the tr that tree is me and I am that tree. And they pointed me to a poem simply called, well, question mark. And sometimes you realise that you're standing on the shoulders of giants, or in my case, I'm sitting in the bough of a tree that has been growing for over 1,000 generations with a view out to the horizon and an imagination that stretches back to a time before time. So my 40-year-old memory may have chosen to recast her words to my own purpose, perhaps. And maybe I've written it and rewritten it, a phrase to make it almost a personal mantra, but here is her poem. Hello, tree. Talk to me. I'm, I'm sick and lonely. Are you old? Trunk so cold, what secrets do you hold? Talk, tree. Can't you see my troubles trouble me? Silent tree. Let me see your answers answer me. Tree. You dare question me? You, how dare you dare question me? And at this point you say, and she would shit herself 
if the tree talked back. Thank you very much.